Now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. Hey, welcome back to The Law Show on CL 650. We're talking about estate law and estate planning. And joining us today, John Lakes and John White from Lakes White LLP in North Vancouver. Where are you located in North Van? We are at 879 Marine Drive, and for people who uh, know North Van or remember North Van from a few years ago, that's right where Dave Buck Ford used to be. It's right across the street from Capilano Mall on Marine Drive, uh, right in uh, one of the main areas of town. And I, I, I think I remember correctly, you have free parking. We do. Oh, that's gold. And lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. All right, so we're talking about wrapping up um, an estate and the executor's job. Uh, so let's touch on paying the bills. I mean, you, when, when somebody passes away, the, the hydro bill has to be finalized, the CRA. So what, what do they have to do? Well, the problem is when you become executor, you also are taking into the, somebody else's shoes and deal with their obligations. And creditors are paid first, and the Canadian Revenue Agency gets paid the very first of them all. So when someone has died, uh, technically under the Income Tax Act of Canada, the estate is frozen until the Canadian Revenue Agency has issued what's called a clearance certificate, which may take up to two years. So if somebody dies, let's say they die in, in March of 2016, once the executor has been appointed and letters probably have been issued, they're going to have to arrange for the 2015 tax return to be filed. Once they get the assessment notice from for the 2015, then they can apply to pay the 2016 taxes. And then once they get the assessment notice of 2016, they can apply for what's called a clearance certificate. And that certificate confirms that all taxes have been paid under the Income Tax Act of Canada, technically an estate is frozen until the clearance certificate is issued, which may be up to a year and a half to two years. And who's paying uh, Who's paying the hydro bill on the house well, all that time? Well, in the meantime, you can still deal with the day-to-day -day expenses. And depending on what the situation is with somebody, um, there may be some releases of some funds ahead of time if they think everything's okay. Now, the problem is, is when somebody dies... That is when there's some big tax bills available. So first of all, if there's an RSP or RIF, those funds, unless it goes to their spouse, are included in their taxable income at the time of death. And second of all, um, if you've got like a cottage or a second piece of property, there might be some capital gains as well. So it's important when you become an executor, first of all, to try to get copies of old tax returns and second of all, get T4s and T5s, which raises another issue because it used to everybody used to get all that stuff in the mail. Now sometimes they can't. So if someone is doing a will, what they should do is they should leave with their will a list of all their creditors, their account, tax account information, and so forth, so people can know where to find it. Now they also have to deal with all the other creditors, like credit cards and mortgages and debts and things like that. So and if they don't deal with creditors properly and they distribute the estate and somebody resurfaces later, then they could be personally liable for it. Hmm. That's and, a big job then. Well, it's big a huge job. job. And uh, sometimes they have to, sometimes they find out about things about people they don't really want to know and find out that, yeah, their sister Susan may have had a really good lifestyle. However, it was all done in lines and credit and debts and and sometimes as executor, you have to tell these kids of hers. There's no money. Well, I was, read, I was left. reading a story in the paper last week, and they were saying, you know, uh, um, that the, the offspring of baby boomers are expecting to get this windfall of cash, <laughs> and and, the, and mom and dad have spent yeah. it all. Well, yeah, that's a, true. What sometimes called the, you know, they they go on what's sometimes called a, you know, a ski vacation, spending the kids' inheritance. <laughs> that's I mean, and then the other thing too is if someone has more debt than assets. Yeah, what happens then? Well, it's called an insolvent estate. It's like a bankruptcy only with a deceased person. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, CRA comes first, but. Uh, and in that case, they quite often have to hire an accountant as well, too. But well, uh, I've, I've heard of people saying, I'm, I'm, when I kick off, I'm going to owe as much money as I can. Well, an example I had was a client of mine now deceased, and he, uh, he, what he did is he was diagnosed with a type of cancer, and he was given a year to live, and the first 11 year, months would be pretty good. 
and last month wasn't going to be very good and his he had had two wives his first wife had a life insurance policy so she was okay the second wife didn't and he didn't like her anyway and what he did is he cashed out all his RSPs he had about eight or ten different credit cards he spent 11 months traveling world on luxury train trips like doing the ones in South Africa and, Express Express and, and everything else and they came back and he died and he left he owed CRA over a hundred thousand dollars and he owed credit cards over a hundred thousand dollars and he had twenty thousand dollars in his account needless to say nobody fought over his estate but yeah. uh, and the executor didn't even bother applying because there was nothing to it but so what happens in that case it's just these these uh, credit card companies that's are that's why luck. you pay 18 percent on your uh, credit card yeah that's true Okay, any other things that we should touch on about paying out um, existing bills? Um, one of the things you do as executive, you can also always negotiate too as executive. You could always try to uh, negotiate, and sometimes there may be an issue that a litigator has to go to court to determine whether it's a legitimate debt or not as well too. Well, it could be. I mean, uh, and just as if the, uh, the alleged debtor were alive, other than you don't have the benefit of that person's evidence. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, debts, of course, can be challenged just because somebody says you owe them money doesn't mean you do. Um, often does, but not always. So these are personal, personal no. l uh, loans, right? Well, you sometimes get within families issues whether something's a gift or whether it's a debt. Then there's so someone, issues. Then uh, if someone gives money towards a down payment of a home. Was that a gift or was there that a loan? There are just dozens and dozens of cases where that happens. It's usually in, in uh, where the it's usually the parents uh, giving slash loaning money to uh, one of their kids who's married uh, to buy a home um, or to help buy a home, and then uh, that marriage breaking up, and then one often sees a, a dispute uh, between the the sort of the married in. Uh, spouse and the parents who fronted the money as to whether the the money was a gift or a loan, um, and it, or that tends to depend on what people said their intentions were at the time so and they've how they've split, conducted themselves. They've split the home, and uh, they have half of the assets, and then and then when they're they're gone, they say, right. "Well, actually, you owe us that money back because yeah. that, we didn't give it to you; we lent it to you." Well, uh, and I had one. Well, I mean, about fifteen, quite a long time before I was with John. And what happened is that parents had lent money to this daughter and son-in-law, and it was like $40,000 to to buy a house. There was nothing in writing. This is back when you could buy a house with $40,000. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, no, but it wasn't that bad. But anyway, then, then, then the daughter died. Mm -hmm. And then, lo and behold, six months later, the son-in-law went off and got married to somebody else, and then all of a sudden they... They, they said wait back. they wanted their money back, but of course they had nothing in writing and there was some issue about limitation as well because there's this whole issue about demands and that can raise family debts can be a bit of a problem whether a debt or a gift. Well, let's talk about gifts um, right. and what you have to say in your <laughs> will. For example, I give a sum of uh, $10,000 to my brother Liam Larson. Can you... Uh, and you have to name people specifically, well, right? Well, in a will, so we let's say we've dealt with the assets, we've dealt with the debt, and then we got some money left over. Mm -hmm. So not all wills, but some wills may leave specific items to specific people. So they leave ten thousand dollars to my brother Liam, um, and then the issue is what happens if Liam dies before you do or not. And so, if Liam has died, does it? go to his family or does it go back to the estate what happens if you've got you say i give ten thousand dollars to liam larson and the problem is you've got both a brother called liam larson and a nephew called liam larson right. um or else you could have a situation where you live you leave ten thousand dollars to research cancer in british columbia where you have a problem that you haven't defined who it is and there's like a you know 50 organizations that that research cancer in Canada. So the problem is an issue. First of all, if the person who you've left money to doesn't isn't there anymore, or is, or there's some vagueness as to who's supposed to receive the funds. You have a story, don't you, about uh, a confusion of a name and how they defined who was actually going to get the benefit? Well, yeah. I mean, there are, there are problems uh, that can arise if the will doesn't name the proposed charitable beneficiary properly. Um, and, you know, there are 
examples you can come up with, you know, the, the BC Cancer Society versus the Cancer Society of BC, you know, that that sort of misnomer. Uh, but there was a case uh, from England called Edwards and Smith, uh, which I absolutely love because it was a, a will that uh, left uh, a sum of money to something called the Wesleyan Methodist Superannuated Ministers Fund, uh, which is a wonderful title. The problem was it didn't exist. Uh, but there was something, it was proven in evidence uh, before the judge, that there was something uh, out there called the Connectional Society of the Wesleyan Methodist Church. And that society had a fund that they called the Superannuated or Worn Out Preacher's Fund. <laughs> and uh, And the judge sort of looked at those two names and thought, you know what, uh, clearly the testator had this superannuated worn out preacher's fund in mind uh, when they left the money to the Wesleyan Me Me Methodist superannuated minister's fund. And then the, the judge essentially connected the dots on that. Uh, and well, that's, uh, that's, that's easier because there's yeah. not a lot of confusion out there about other things with similar names. Well, there can't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when you have a Liam Larson, mm -hmm. you, you, the, the best advice is to what? Name that person and date their birth? Well, you can define them as your brother or you can define them as your nephew. Um, sometimes if you're, let's say you're from Germany and it's a friend, what I try to do is have put the person's actual address. Mm. Because you have a problem that it, we're we've just gone to state right now where uh, someone's left monies to people in Germany. Now we've had to hire skip tracers to try to find these people because we have no means, no indication how who, who these people are. The last known address of, of, of this. Yeah, and you see, you have to notify these people, and um, so if you know if you think highly enough some to give somebody to somebody then make sure they can be found. I mean, you people can usually find brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. but it's more for friends who come and friends who go. And sometimes with Facebook and things like that, it's easier now to trace people, but, you know, that's a generational thing, and a lot of the people that are dying right now don't have any Facebook contacts. But what we're going to talk about when we come back are some anecdotal stories. One is the famous uh, 1920s, uh, Stork Derby and also the Spence case. Uh, we'll pick that up when we come back on the law show talking about a state law with um, the, the two Johns. Here we have John Lakes and John White from Lakes White LLP in North Vancouver. We'll continue it next on CL 650. There's more of the show still ahead. This is the law show on CL 650.